Hello world, welcome back to another tutorial. Today we're gonna to be talking about 3D and fuck man, I am excited. We're going from two dimensions to three dimensions. We're gonna be talking about some perspective matrices, orthographic matrices, matrices in general. We're gonna be updating our camera. We're gonna be making a cube, a cube. Okay, it's not that exciting, but it's pretty cool because it's gonna bring us into the realm of new shit and uh, get pumped. I'm excited, let's go. All right, before we jump into 3D, I wanna talk about fundamentals. Projections, what is a projection? Well, I'll show you a perspective projection. See this text right in front of you? It's small, right? Boom, in your face, right? It looks small way off in the distance, but as it comes closer, um, you know, it gets bigger and that is projection. Um, obviously, it's just farther away, so it's smaller and closer, it's bigger, but uh, no, that's not the case. Uh, technically, that text is just scaling in size but it looks like it's coming at you, right? So that is a form of projection. There are two primary forms of projection. There's perspective and orthographic. Perspective is where things get smaller as they go off into the distance and they're really big up in your face. And orthographic is where things are exactly the same size no matter how far you get away from the camera, but you add layering to the depth. So projection is basically adding depth to your scene, uh, whether it's perspective or orthographic. And there's reasons for both, using both. Um, on the left, you see we have two trees and a path, right? Well, the tree in, way off in the distance is smaller than the tree in front. So it's applying this perspective uh, projection on this scene where the path gets smaller as it goes off into the distance. You'll see this with train tracks. It's a very common example. Whereas with the orthographic on the right, everything's the exact same size. They're two, the exact same scene. Both the left and the right are the exact same scene. But orthographic maintains the exact same size. This is really good in two dimensional games, um, like a platform game. And I'll show you one in just a second. A really good perspective projection example is Minecraft. If you look at like the trees that are near the camera, they're a lot bigger than the white trees way off in the distance. And that's because what's happening is they're applying a perspective projection on the, you know, in the game engine. Um, if you look at a game called Ori and the Blind Forest, which I recommend, it's bomb as fuzz. Um, this is a orthographic projection. These are actually three-dimensional objects. I, I, I watched the, you know, making of. These are actually three-dimensional objects being rendered in two dimensions, okay, using an orthographic projection. What you see, it looks like there's trees off in the distance. What are you talking about? They're getting smaller as it goes way back. No, what that is, is that's something called parallaxing, and it's just kind of visually messing with your mind and just just know that this scene this two-dimensional scene is using an orthographic projection because it it works perfectly here going back to minecraft um the block in the front is very close to you so it's a lot bigger and the block way back there is a lot smaller right that's perspective transformation but if you look at the hud at the bottom of the screen, that stands for a heads up display for you layman. Um, the HUD at the bottom of the screen, um, that's orth that could be orthographic projection. You know, it doesn't matter where the display is really, they just need to make sure that it's in front of the user at all times. So they could be applying an orthographic uh, projection on the HUD. So you can use orthographic and projection in the same scene. If you look at the sword, the sword could uh, pretend that was like a 3D image rotating or something. They could also apply a perspective transformation inside of an orthographic transformation with a perspective, like all sorts of perspective and orthographic in the exact same scene. It doesn't necessarily need to just be one or the other. It could be both. Going forward, uh, perspective projection on the left and orthographic on the right. This is a really good representation of what actually is going on. With perspective projection, this is known as a view frustrum, okay? The, the like dotted lines going off in the distance. Let me pull it up so I can use my mouse. Up right here, you see the camera looking in this direction. The first thing it sees is the near clipping plane. This is actually a representation of your view of your display of our game view, you know, um, where the green ball is a lot bigger than the red ball. And you can see that because the red ball is back farther than the green ball. That looks normal. Anything before the clipping plane, by the way, will not get rendered. Off in the distance, you have the far clipping plane, left, top, right, and bottom. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna clip off everything after that. So say you put your view from this is one to a thousand, everything from a thousand to one will be rendered, everything else, nope. Not even this ball, because this ball is not in the view frustrum. 
okay? On the left, or on, excuse me, on the right, we have orthographic projection. We have the camera looking out here, but it's just this box, right? So everything maintain, every, there is distance, there is depth in the scene, but there's the same exact size. You know, it really helps when you're doing like a platform game, platform 2D game to use a projection because, you know, you can put things behind and in front, but you don't, they, they're gonna maintain that same size and shape. But the green ball is still on the outside because a camera cannot see that ball. Um, we took our original vertex position, um, which was in local space, and we multiplied that by mo our model matrix, right? Which put it into world space. We took that world space matrix and we multiplied it by the view matrix and put it into eye space, so like with our camera, okay? So we have these three things going on right now. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply something called a projection matrix, okay? The projection matrix will then put it into normalized device space coordinates, okay? So now we're in normalized device space and we end up with our new vertex position. Okay, so every one of these matrices is a transformation. Um, but they're a little bit different. These two, the model matrix and the view matrix, are affine transformations, meaning that as you move the vertices, like say you multiply two vertices by the same exact model matrix and view matrix, they're gonna move in the exact same, the, at the exact same distance as each other. You know, they're gonna kind of move together around the screen. Whereas if you apply a projection matrix, that is a projection transform. And a projection transform doesn't necessarily need to maintain the distance between those two. Um, like I said, with the perspective, as things go farther off in the distance, they get smaller. Things up in your face are bigger. You know, it's gonna need to adjust the vertices based on that distance. And that's done using oh, math, right? And then what we end up with is homogeneous clip space. Um, so I said that we go, say we go from one to a thousand, right? So there's this huge gap of 999 units, whatever the hell a unit is. Well, there's not 999 space coordinates on your screen. It's still in screen space. We're still going from negative one on the left and positive one on the right. Your screen is still in those screen space, right? And so what we need, what the projection matrix does is it narrow, it takes those, you know, you put a hundred, a hundred, a hundred for a float three as a position. It'll take that value, narrow it down into a negative one to one value so that it can render it on the screen. That's basically what the projection matrix does, okay? And so what we end up with is homogeneous clip space coordinates. I'm done talking, there's tons to be said. Let's start coding because I'm fucking, I'm ready. So back in our code, we have, well, this cool little pointer thing going on. And um, you can move the camera around left and right and up and down, and the pointers kind of find follow your pointer. Cool, that's awesome. Um, but what we wanna do is we wanna turn this into a three-dimensional scene. Actually, I don't wanna turn this, I wanna create a different three-dimensional scene. So let's do that, let's go 3D. Where I'm gonna start is I'm gonna go to game engines under math, so math, maths. And we're gonna add, first of all, we're gonna add a, um, an extension to our float. And I'll just copy and paste that in here uh, right at the top. And what that's gonna have is we're gonna be able to convert whatever number we're currently working with directly to radians or two degrees. And that's really important in the function that I'm about to copy and paste. So go into our extension matrix float four by four, go all the way to the bottom under the rotate function, create a little space there. And I'm gonna paste this calculation. So what we have here is we have our perspective calculation. Right here, there's gonna be a link to where I got this calculation and this formula. Um, it's just kind of on Stack Exchange for game dev, which is a pretty cool site if you ever wanna learn some more stuff about OpenGL and whatnot. Uh, most of the documentation I get is from OpenGL documentation, which is kind of funny. Um, but here you'll see in the very top, uh, we're using that two radians that we created up in the top of our um, file. So let's go through it. Um, we can call matrix float four by four dot perspective that will generate a new matrix float four by four. Um, the first parameter is the degrees field of view. Um, so that's gonna be the field of view in degrees. Um, so basically what the field of view is, you're like, what, the, what is the field of view? I have no idea what that means. Well, I'm gonna tell you, uh, best way I can think of how to explain it would be to take a paper towel uh, tube, like the inside of the paper towel tube. Um, once you're done with it, you know, uh, you're like, what am I gonna do with this tube? Well, let's play with uh, the, the, the field of views, whatever. Uh, so look down that tube. 
And the first thing you notice is everything looks zoomed in. Everything looks closer through the tube. Is it because it's magnifying it? Is it because there's a magical lens that's making everything closer? And the answer is no. What's happening is purely because your field of view is shrinking. Right now with just an open eyeball, your field of view is huge. You know, it goes out in that frustrum that we were talking about. Um, but when you narrow it down to just the end of a circle of a tube, uh, that tube is gonna be closer to the object one, and two, it's going to be, like that object is gonna be covering more of the space inside of the tube circle. Um, so that's kind of what the field of view represents. The aspect ratio is going to be anything you want, um, you can make it one. Uh, so it's basically a box, uh, but a really good common aspect ratio is 16 by nine. So your TVs are probably 16 by nine. Um, so it's whatever display you're working on or whatever you want the aspect ratio to be. Right now, we're probably gonna just set it to our displays, uh, you know, uh, aspect ratio. The near value is going to be as close as the frustrum is to your face. And so everything before the near value uh, will get clipped. Look up clipping, we might talk about it in the future, but clipping is really important here. Perspective uh, clips a lot. And so everything in front of the near won't be rendered, it'll be clipped. And everything after the far will be clipped as well. And so that'll be like, you know, put that to 100. And then the units that we use are gonna be from uh, the near to the far. So if it's one to a hundred, there's 99 center units. You know what I'm saying? Um, so yeah, let's kind of go through the function. Uh, we have our field of view that's being calculated. We want to convert that to radians. So we don't need to pass in radians here. We just pass in like a common one is 45. That's like dead center. The higher the field of view, the closer it is to the thing. Um, and then we do this calculation that I found here. And if you guys want to see me do some calculations, like converting this formula to uh, you know, code, I can try, uh, it's kind of weird to do, but that's basically all I did right here. And then I'm returning a new, uh, matrix floor, float four by four with these new values. And you can write this however you want. You can actually make this like a mutating function. I didn't, I just wanted to return a new matrix float four by four. So that's our perspective calculation in our math file. Next thing I want to talk about is using this perspective matrix. Um, and so the place we're going to do that is inside of our, uh, well, let's go at it first. So we're gonna need a way to pass this thing around. Uh, and the best place to do that is going to be in our scene. Um, so in our scene constants, uh, cause your scene is basically the projection that you're using. We're gonna want a uh, projection matrix. And that's gonna be like in Minecraft, it's the scenes projection. Uh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you get it, you get it. Um, so we'll put, uh, Right here at the bottom and seeing constants of our types folder, we'll put um, the projection matrix. And then inside of our shaders file, we're also going to want to go down to our scene constants, type float four by four projection matrix. And then um, like I showed you in the description, all we simply need to do is multiply everything we currently have right now times our projection matrix. So I'm going to go at the very end here, dot projection matrix, and we're going to multiply that. Uh, so the way I remember it is just position, but then we do position MVP. Like I'm the MVP, son, the real MVP, the MVP of 3D. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah. So in position times MVP, and that will generate the vertice in three dimensional space. Or, um, if you use like orthographic projection, if you pass that through, it'll create it in that two dimensional space, like we talked about before. So, um, now that it's in the GPU being calculated, we just need to kind of use it around, right? So we created our perspective in our math. Let's go apply that. So our camera will have the perspective applied to it. You know, it's the view is the camera. I showed you the view frustrum picture. The beginning is a camera. So under position, under the protocol of camera, I'm gonna create a new variable and I'm gonna call that projection matrix. And uh, that will be a matrix float four by four. And we'll instantiate that on each camera we have because each camera is gonna do a little bit different things. Um, so the projection matrix, get, bada boom. Uh, go down to our debug camera because now if we build, uh, everything breaks. So under position, we're gonna go var projection matrix and we're gonna create that. And then you'll notice I made it a get, right? Why did I just make it a get? Well, because we're going to be returning matrix float four by four dot perspective. 
and uh, the perspective doesn't really change. That calculation is gonna stay the same every single time. The only thing that will change is these values. And remember, you can do matrix float four by four orthographic. I'm not doing it in this episode, but you totally could right here with the projection matrix. Um, degrees FOV, like I said, we're gonna do 45. Aspect ratio, we're gonna calculate that. So go back over to your file structure and go down to our renderer um, file. And as you can see, we have screen size right here. Well, um, we have the screen size. Let's just do a dynamic uh, calculation of the aspect ratio on the fly. So I'm gonna make that a float, a float, uh, float. And I'm just gonna return the screen size dot width, which is X divided by screen size dot Y. So the width divided by the height. So that's gonna return the aspect ratio of the current view I'm working on because we're already calculating the screen size. Go back to debug camera, go to your aspect ratio, and now we can just do renderer dot aspect ratio. The near is gonna be simple, it's 0 0.1, and the far, I'll put it at 1,000, so it's way off in the distance for now. And boom, our cameras now have a projection matrix. Let's pass the projection matrix of our camera through to the GPU. Um, we do that in our scene. We're already doing it with our view matrix. So if you scroll down, uh, we have this function update scene constants where we're setting the view matrix. Well, let's just set the scene constants dot projection matrix equal to the camera manager dot current camera dot projection matrix. Boom, that's all we need to do. We don't need to pass any other scene constants. It's, a, it's basically an object and we're passing the object through to the GPU. Um, so our scene's all set up. We're passing stuff through, looks good. We need a three-dimensional object. We were using triangles, which were 2D. That, that's kind of boring. Um, we know that they're 2D triangles. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new file down in game objects, and I am going to call that file, uh, let's call it cube. Okay, so it's gonna be game object that is a cube. But right now we don't have a cube mesh. If you notice in pointer, we initialized it and we set it to a mesh type. So let's go to our mesh library and create that. So I'm gonna scroll all the way down to the bottom. I'm gonna create a new class called cube underscore custom mesh, custom mesh. And then I've already kind of created this thing. Um, I'm gonna give you guys this code. So if you don't wanna like uh, type it all out, you don't have to, but I will scroll through it a little bit. You see we have our cube custom mesh. We're creating the vertices. <clears throat> we create the left side of our cube, which is two triangles. So this is the triangle one, this is triangle two, and then the right side, the top, the bottom, the back, and the front. And I just wanted to scroll through all those. So if you do want to copy these, I recommend you going through the process of creating your own cube because it's one, it's kind of fun, sort of, it's tedious, but fun. And you learn a lot about like three dimensional space and placing things, you get really good at it. Um, the next thing I did was I just kind of created uh, these colors randomly. I just went through and made some random ass colors so that, um, you know, you can tell it's a cube. If it's just all the same color, it'll look like a blob of space because there's no lighting. So add the color, it's important. Um, now that we have our cube custom mesh class, I'm gonna scroll to the top of this mesh library file under the enum of mesh types and I'm gonna create a new case and it's going to be cube underscore custom. And then let's just add it to the library upon load. So I'm gonna go meshes.updateValue, cube underscore custom mesh, four key dot cube a custom, and boom. So now we have this custom mesh available to us whenever the fuzz we want. Go back to our cube file, delete everything, import a metal kit because why the fuzz not? A class, cube, and that will be a game object. And then I'm just going to do an initializer, a basic one, uh, and then do super dot init of dot cube custom. So now I have a cube object. Let's use it. Let's put this in our scene. Go to the sandbox scene, delete all this stuff, or don't delete it, create a new scene, do whatever you want. I'm gonna delete it. Um, and then on the outside of the build scene, I'm gonna create a variable and I'm gonna call it cube. And I'm gonna set that equal to a new cube object. And then I'm gonna simply add the child of cube to the scene. And let's go back out and we're gonna press play and see what happens. Basically, we're gonna go through it. <laughs> Let me just put it that way, all right? Um, so you're like, whoa, what's this? Oh, what's going on? Well, we're technically in a box. 
right? So we're inside of a box. If you kind of scroll left and right with our camera, we're inside of a box, cool. Um, this is skybox. It's not really a skybox, but it's the idea of a skybox. Anyway, so we're in a cube. Let's back up the camera a little bit because obviously the camera is a little bit up in our face. And so I'm gonna go debug camera dot position dot Z equals, we'll put five. So we'll go off back a little bit. And then just to kind of make it more clear that it's uh, three dimensions, I'm gonna go super dot update. I'm gonna create just like a rotation of the cube down here. So we'll go cube dot rotation dot X plus equals delta time cube dot rotation dot Y plus equals delta time. And then we'll press play and see what happens. So we move the camera back and now we're rotating as well. Make sure. Boom, 3D. Well, you're like, wait, we're in 3D, but there's like this weird stuff going on. That's not supposed to happen. Um, and that's because uh, there's something that we have not accounted for yet and I haven't really even mentioned is the depth buffer. The depth buffer is something that we need to actually activate. Um, right now it's not even saying looking at depth. It's just kind of saying, uh, am I a pixel? Put me on the screen. Am I a pixel? Put me on the screen. No matter which order I come in, put me on the screen. Um, and so what's happening is pixels are overwriting other pixels or they're not writing to other pixels. And so what we need is we need a depth buffer. The depth buffer is uh, can be automatic. Uh, it's pretty easy to have a depth buffer. Um, so we're gonna go through that process right now. First thing we're gonna need though, is we're gonna need depth stencil states. Those will maintain our depth buffer. So go to our libraries. You guys got it. We're creating a new library. Uh, and I will keep, I'll give you this code, you can copy and paste it, but I'm gonna still go through it. Uh, depth, um, depth stencil state library. So if you guys have read any books or anything on three dimensions uh, or three dimension like graphics, uh, this is known as the depth test. So every time a pixel comes through, it's like, okay, am I in front of another pixel that's already been written? Am I closer to the screen? Is my Z value closer to the screen than that Z value? And if I am, write me. Else, don't write me, discard me. I, don't put me anywhere on the screen because there's already a pixel in my place. Um, and so that's kind of how this is going to work. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go import metal kit because I'm gonna need it. And then I'm gonna come over here and grab a uh, code that I've already coded because I'm smart like that. And I'm gonna paste it in. So let's go through it. The top, we have our depth stencil state types. First one is less. I'll cover it in a second. Uh, then we create the actual library here. We have a dictionary of these state types, which is this and then the depth stencil state, which is this protocol right here uh, that just has a depth stencil state, MTL depth stencil state value inside of it. Um, we initialize this, we actually need to call that. So we'll do it in a second. Um, upon initialization, we're gonna create the default depth stencil states. Uh, and that just kind of adds our object, which is this that extends this depth stencil state into the library or the dictionary um, immediately. And so we'll have that access from anywhere inside the application. And then we have this function to call outside of this application. Um, so let's instantiate this real quick. Go to engine, the file engine, and then under, let's say vertex descriptor library, I'm gonna go depth stencil state, shoot, I didn't say rare dot initialize, like so. Depth stencil state library dot initialize. It, it'll be good. Um, I think it's just tripping. What's going on here? Apparently, oh, initialize, initialize. Okay, I didn't spell it right, apparently, in my Death Stencil State Library, so make sure you spell that right. Boom! Depth Stencil State Library, access anywhere. Um, and then down here, we have our class of less depth, depth stencil state. Um, so uh, the initializer just kind of creates it. So we need a descriptor, a depth stencil descriptor, just like we have a render pipeline descriptor. We need a depth stencil descriptor to, des uh, to describe the state. Um, we need to set the depth right enabled equal to true because we need depth. And we also need to set the depth compare function to something. Now, if I go dot right here, you'll see all of these, oh, you'll see all of these uh, different things we can do, the compare functions. We're doing less. Um, because what's happening is it's saying, is the distance between me and this pixel less than that pixel? If I am, write me, else discard me. Um, so it's just like the compare function for um, 
whether or not I'm going to write a pixel or not write a pixel. And we just need to kind of set this on the scene, uh, but we're not gonna do it on the scene. We're gonna do a per object because that's what we're gonna do. Um, so go to our game objects uh, file here. Uh, I'm gonna move up this render pipeline state library because really it, we need to set the render pipeline state then the model constants so that they go into there. Anyway, just move that up, it's better. Uh, so go to, yeah, and then we're gonna move this guy up because this makes way more sense. We're gonna set this at zero and then this at two and then scene constants is at one. Anyway, so I put them in this order. Underneath here, I'm gonna say render command encoder dot set depth stencil state to the depth stencil state library dot depth stencil state dot less. And I'll put this up a little bit more so you guys can see it. Uh, yeah, so now we're setting every time we render an object, the depth stencil. So it's actually going to keep track of our depth at less value, at least per object, uh, which is nice. Uh, so now we have our depth stencil state. The problem is the it's a buffer. It's kind of a texture, right? So it's writing to a texture and we need a texture pixel format of that texture. And so we'll do that by first creating it. Um, so I'm gonna go to my preferences file. I'm gonna copy the main pixel format cause it's gonna be very similar. Right under that, I'm gonna go main depth pixel format. And then I'm gonna change that type to dot depth 32 float. This might depend on your system. And if you're having trouble here and it's breaking, hit me up on discord or in the comments or whatever. And I will totally help you through this problem. I do not fear that. So now that we have our preferences dot main depth pixel format, let's go update our game view to have, well, it has a color pixel format. We also need the self dot depth stencil pixel format equal to preferences dot depth. I'm telling you guys, we're getting closer. Uh, preferences dot main depth pixel format. And then we've set it here. And just like we set this color pixel format on our render pipeline state, we also need to do it on our descriptor. So go to render pipeline descriptor library, go to the bottom, go to our basic render pipeline descriptor. And underneath here, just type render pipeline descriptor dot depth attachment pixel format equals preferences dot main depth pixel format. Boom. Cool. So now we have a depth buffer. If I press play, my assumption is everything's great and cool. In 3D, you know what I'm saying? 3D. Boy. Uh, so my computer just froze a little bit and, oh, okay. So what does that look like? Does that look like 3D to you? It looks like 3D to me because it is. Um, orthographic would look a lot different. Remember this is perspective uh, projection and then you can do orthographic if you want. Maybe test yourself, homework assignment. Uh, but yeah, this is the perspective projection of three dimensional scene. Pretty cool stuff. Um, yeah, if you guys have any questions, hit me up. I'm gonna leave it right here because I think this is a good place to end it. Uh, but if you have any questions, let me know. I'll help you out. Go to Discord, go to the comments. Uh, people, other people in Discord have been super freaking helpful. Uh, let me let me just bring that up real quick. So in Discord, we have this channel where we all talk and about like problems that we're having. So if you have a question, it's not very big right now. There's not too many people. There's like 10 people in there right now. Uh, but if I go to my metal uh, game engine, you'll see that uh, people are helping people. Like, look, look, this guy, look, Space posted some code, okay? And he's like, this is what I have right now. And he's like, what am I doing? And then we, we're gonna go in there, I'm gonna go in there and probably help him out. And then other people help out too. Shout out to, uh, like, Leaf Embrulelis. I don't know how to say his name, but these guys are pretty badass. Uh, you know, all of these guys are super supportive of the channel and the community. And we're really trying to make it so metal is easy to learn as opposed to like OpenGL, which is hard to learn. So if you guys have any questions, let let me know. Um, we'll get through it. We'll, we'll learn this together because this is some really sweet stuff. And as you can see, we're in 3D. So we're going to keep moving on from here. So I hope you guys like this episode. Yeah. See you later.